from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Susan Vita, the Chief of the Music Division, and we are delighted to gather tonight for another presentation in a series of lecture that we co-sponsor with the American Musicological Society. The Music Division's collections include more than 20 million items related to music, theater, and dance. Collections that draw researchers from all over the world in search of rare and unique material. This lecture, lecture series affords society members the opportunity to share research that stems directly from their own work in our collections. And since beginning the series in 2008, we've been treated to, a fascinating, to fascinating papers on a wide array of topics and composers, from Beethoven to Ruth Crawford Seeger to Irving Berlin to Louis Armstrong. Tonight we will hear from Dr. Benigali and learn more about the ever popular Rhapsody in Blue, composed by George Gershwin and arranged by Ferdy Griffet. The music division is fortunate to hold the papers of both Gershwin and Griffet, together documenting the creative process between, behind an iconic work. Again, I welcome those of you here tonight to the Madison Building, as well as those of you who will watch the lecture via the Library of Congress YouTube channel. The Performing Arts Reading Room is home to the Music Division, located just downstairs from us on the first floor of the Madison Building. It is our great hope that these lectures will inspire others in the musicological community, especially young scholars beginning their studies and careers, to visit the Library of Congress and explore the great riches of our collections firsthand. Those of you who might be interested in giving future lectures can either see staff at the outside of the um, room out there or can contact us directly and we can let you know how you do that. <clears throat> For your information, um, the book being discussed tonight, Arranging Gershwin, will be is on sale here um, just outside the Montpelier room, and a book signing will follow the lecture. And now, before we hear from Dr. Benigale, I would like to introduce Dr. Ellen T. Harris, Professor Emerita from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and President of the American Musicological Society, who will offer greetings from the society. Ellen? Thank you, Sue. For many members of the American Musicological Society, the music division of the Library of Congress is a home away from home. It is a privilege and a pleasure for scholars to work in these collections. Music historians are indebted to the library and the music division not only for making their rare materials available for study, but also as co-sponsors with the AMS of this lecture series which provides the opportunity for us to share the riches of these collections with a wider public. Tonight's lecture, the first to be scheduled in the lovely Montpelier room, and I do hope if you've not been here that you look out the window before you go with where they haven't drawn the curtains yet, um, of the Madison Building. This is the 16th in the ongoing sequence of lectures. Our speaker tonight is Ryan Banagale, an assistant professor of music at Colorado College, where he offers classes on American music topics, including musical theater, jazz, popular music, and media studies. He received his PhD at Harvard University in 2011 with a dissertation on the arrangements of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. This research was supported by the American Musicological Society's AMS 50 and Howard Mayer Brown Fellowships. In the fall of 2014, Oxford University Press published his first book titled Arranging Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blue and the Creation of an American Icon, with support from AMS 75 Pay's Publication Subvention Award. 
His scholarly articles appear in such journals as Jazz Perspectives and the Journal of the Society for American Music. He currently sits on the editorial board of the George Gershwin Critical Edition and is almost finished editing the first of four separate arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue. In his spare time, I just, that was his phrase. In his spare time, he is co-host of the monthly radio program, Critical Karaoke, a show about music and the ideas it inspires, as well as a regular contributor to Critical Karaoke's daily two-minute modules, a, a day in the life. Both programs can be accessed at criticalkaraoke.com or as a podcast from iTunes. Tonight, Professor Vanagale will talk to us about the compositional history of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue using documents from the Music Division of the Library of Congress to discuss the musical genesis of the composition and its continuing adaptations and arrangements while illuminating the significant role of musicians beyond Gershwin in the lifespan of this work. His paper is entitled The Ongoing Composition of Rhapsody in Blue. Please help me welcome Ryan Banagale. Thank you very much. Um, it is really wonderful to be back here in Washington, D.C. As uh, President Harris mentioned, the Library of Congress really is a, a home away from home for a lot of us musicologists, especially the ones that work in the, in the holdings here. Um, this is actually part of what's almost become an annual pilgrimage to the Library of Congress. So uh, thank you all so much for joining me here this evening for the talk. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to offer a few acknowledgments. Uh, first, thank you to President Ellen Harris and the American Musicological Society for not only making this lecture possible, but for supporting this research in numerous forms, much of which you heard about during her introduction. None of this research would have happened without the incredible staff of the music division at the Library of Congress over the course of many, many years. And it's nice to see so many faces out here that I've, I've worked with um, in, the, in the collections. Uh, Susan Vita became chief of the division just as this research began. And I'm particularly indebted to the efforts and observations and insights of Mark Horowitz and Raymond White. Thank you also to Kate Miller and Nick Brown for their assistance organizing and producing tonight's event. I'd also like to publicly thank Colorado College, my home institution, for making additional research in the music division possible. I'd like to thank the Bernstein office for granting me permission to share some of the images and music that you'll see tonight, and also Alfred Publishing and the estate of George Gershwin for additionally granting permission for me to share these images with you and for supporting my scholarship as a whole. <clears throat> Those of, you, uh, those of us that uh, work with music under copyright are particularly aware of the potential pitfalls of working with the states. And I've been fortunate to have the support of the George Gershwin heirs um, who have at no time challenged my general thesis or approach to Rhapsody in Blue. And actually I have to admit to you all, it isn't really my thesis, um, but rather one that I've borrowed from Leonard Bernstein. Uh, a little over 60 years ago, in 1955, Bernstein published an essay in The Atlantic titled a nice Gershwin tune. Now, within this essay, he declares that Rhapsody in Blue is, quote, not a composition at all, end quote. Now, I'll explain in greater detail what I think he meant by that later in my talk. But for the moment, I want to also declare that Rhapsody in Blue is not a composition. It is an arrangement. And as I hope to convince you, it has been an arrangement from its origins, and it remains an arrangement in the present day. The version of Rhapsody in Blue that you were listening to prior to the start of my talk, which featured Leonard Bernstein as pianist, uh, and he was also conducting the New York Philharmonic from the piano, uh, this is also an arrangement. Well, technically, it's an arrangement of an arrangement, but I'll explain that to you a little bit later in my talk. The point I want to make clear here at the outset is that I consider arrangement to be a form of composition. As such, the compositional history of Rhapsody in Blue emerges only over the course of time, and through the contributions of a multitude of musicians, specifically arrangers. And it's through this process of arrangement that the Rhapsody has secured its iconic standing in American culture. Without arrangers, including first and foremost a man named Ferdy Groffet, without arrangers, who's to say that we would have ever even heard about Rhapsody in Blue? Now, if that question is a bit dubious to you, don't worry, you're in good company. George Gershwin himself would have been doubtful as well. <clears throat> so in the boardroom of the American Society of Authors, Composers, and Publishers, which is more commonly referred to as ASCAP, 
hang framed letters from its notable members. One of these letters from George Gershwin to J.C. Rosenthal, the general manager of ASCAP, is where my story begins. In August of 1928, George Gershwin wrote, Mr. Jerome Kern at lunch the other day brought to my attention that Ferdy Graffet had listed among his compositions the Rhapsody in Blue. Mr. Kern said he objected to this at the last meeting, and he advised me to write to you about it. Mr. Graffet made a very fine orchestration from my completed sketch, but certainly had no hand in the composing. And just above the salutation, he adds, hoping you will straighten this out. <laughs> now, over the course of the last 80 years, various critics and scholars have attempted to straighten out the extent of Grofet's contributions to the piece. We know that Gershwin did not orchestrate Rhapsody in Blue due to time constraints, inexperience, convention, or some combination thereof. Rather, the task fell to Ferdy Grofet, who was the primary arranger for the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. And the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, of course, is the ensemble that premiered Rhapsody in Blue on February 12, 1924. Whiteman's ensemble was neither a typical symphonic orchestra nor a standard jazz band. Each of the three reed players, for example, doubled on a multitude of instruments. Ross Gorman, who performed the infamous opening clarinet glissando and swoop, also played oboe, bass clarinet, alto saxophone, and sopranino saxophone. The other two reed players rotated between baritone, tenor, alto, and soprano saxophones. Additionally, Whiteman's ensemble featured two trumpets and trombones, a tuba player that also played the string bass. There was a pianist, a celeste player, a banjo player, and a percussionist. For the premiere of Rhapsody in Blue, the ensemble also added four additional violins, as well as two French horns. And the photo that you're seeing here on the screen was taken just prior to the premiere of Rhapsody in Blue in 1924. Now, given the complexity of the Whiteman Orchestra, it should not be surprising that Gershwin did not orchestrate the original version of Rhapsody in Blue. So when the American public first experienced the Rhapsody, it was through Ferdi Grofet's arrangement. Although the role of Grofet in the initial creative process of the Rhapsody has never been denied, the extent of his contributions to the origins and ongoing life of the piece have been sidelined due to his status as an arranger. Grofet began arranging Gershwin's so-called completed sketch for performance by the Whiteman Orchestra before Gershwin had even finished composing it. As often repeated in historical literature on the piece, Grofet apparently traveled daily to Gershwin's apartment on West 110th Street in New York City to pick up newly composed pages of the Rhapsody. The original jazz band version of Rhapsody in Blue came together in this way, page by page, leading up to its much celebrated debut at Paul Whiteman's experiment in modern music. The completed sketch to which Gershwin refers in his letter to ASCAP survives as a 56-page, two-piano, short score manuscript in pencil. And that's seen here on the screen. As with all the manuscripts incorporated into my talk tonight, it is housed within the Music Division's holdings here at the Library of Congress. This completed sketch contains 26 specific instrumental assignments in a variety of hands and writing implements that have resulted in divided assessments on Grofet's overall contributions to the Rhapsody. Some scholars, such as Howard Pollock, concluded that Grofet, quote, scrupulously honored Gershwin's intentions, end quote. Others, such as Jerome Schwartz and Don Reno, assigned greater agency to Grofet. However, scholars on both sides of the divide arrived at their conclusions under the assumption that Grofet indeed worked from this pencil document, and I believe that he did not. Rather, it appears that Grofet worked from a fair copy manuscript, a crucial third source document that's previously unconsidered in literature on Rhapsody in Blue. Seen here, the manuscript was compiled in ink by various copyists as Gershwin completed portions of his two piano pencil score. Now, as I will discuss, manuscript evidence suggests that Grofet worked from this fair copy ink manuscript when he began his arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue, not from the pencil manuscript as previously believed. This fair copy ink manuscript bears only 13 specific instrumental assignments, and more than half of these Grofet ignored. And that is significant for a work that contains more than 22,000 notes over the course of 500 measures. Accordingly, with respect to the original sound of the piece, it would seem that Grofet played a significantly larger role in the genesis of the Rhapsody than previously acknowledged. So there may indeed be merit to arranger Ferdi Grofet's compositional claims. 
As a means of exploring this claim, I want to introduce to you this evening this new fair copy document and then situate it between the two known Rhapsody in Blue source manuscripts, Gershwin's aforementioned two piano pencil score and Grofe's arrangement for the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. And from this point forward, I'm going to refer to these documents using the nicknames given in figure one of your handout. That is, pencil for the original pencil manuscript in George Gershwin's hand, ink for this fair copy manuscript, and then Grofe Whiteman for the orchestral score that Grofe prepared. The previously unconsidered ink fair copy manuscript serves as an intermediary document. It provides a snapshot of the Rhapsody in the midst of creation. So considering these three documents side by side sheds new light on the complex and creative process that ultimately brought Rhapsody in Blue to the concert hall. And before we delve into this any further, I'd also like to mention that I'm going to be referring to different melodic themes found within Rhapsody in Blue by the names that are listed in figure two of your handout. And I provided a little uh, inchipit of the different mel melodic lines there. Um, as a refresher, should we sing through those real quick? Dare we? Let me get my copy. So the first theme, the Ritronello theme, this is the opening theme. Right? Okay, the next theme is the stride theme. It goes. The train theme is. Right? That kind of sounds like a train. The shuffle theme. Um, that was one of Bernstein's favorites. We'll get back to that. Um, then there's the famous Andantino love theme. And then, of course, the tag, which also sounds a little bit like uh, Good Evening Friends. So those are the main themes. So we'll come back to those. Um, but you want to keep the hand at handy, because I'll just refer to these by their name here. And these names are given by, uh, by David Schiff, who wrote a handbook on Rhapsody in Blue in the late 1990s. So over the course of the past 20 to 30 years, the ink fair copy manuscript has been the most accessible of the manuscripts located within the Music Division archives. Here we see a picture of the manuscript in a publicity photo of Ferdy Grofe, taken in 1967. The document remained in Grofe's possession until his death in 1972, and eventually arrived at the Library of Congress in two stages, and it can now be found in the Ferdy Grofe collection. Most of the pages in the ink score have been separated, However, they can be reconstructed into distinct groupings as seen on figure three of your handout. And for those of you not in the musicological world, groupings basically is a, a set of nested pages of manuscript paper. Um, so if we can take two or three pages and put them together and see how they line up, we can see the groupings are the size of the passages of music that Gershwin was handing off to Grofe when he was passing music along. From a compositional standpoint, passing along a copy of the score rather than an original pencil manuscript makes a great deal of sense. It seems questionable that Gershwin would want to continue composing the Rhapsody without being able to reference what he had already written. But for some reason, no one seems to have ever questioned this aspect of the Rhapsody's creation story until now. One story that has been told about the creation of the Rhapsody time and time again is that George Gershwin had forgotten about his commission from the Paul Whiteman Orchestra until his older brother Ira Gershwin pointed out a news item about the supposed jazz concerto that Gershwin was writing in a New York Herald Tribune article on January 4th, 1924. Now this article on January 4th apparently spurned George Gershwin into action. Based on this, most scholars agree that the date at the top of the pencil manuscript, January 7th, 1924, indicates the start of Gershwin's work on the Rhapsody as opposed to his completion. Since Grofe's full manuscript for the Whiteman Orchestra bears a February 4th date of completion, received wisdom is that it took slightly less than four weeks to compose Rhapsody in Blue once pen was put to paper. The ink manuscript, however, suggests an even more compressed compositional timeline. The first grouping of the ink manuscript, which is seen here on the screen, corresponds to measures 1 through 29, or the introduction of the Rhapsody until just before the start of the first piano cadenza. Now, I, although many of us that are here tonight are familiar with the Rhapsody, here's what this first grouping sounds like in its original 1924 arrangement. It's a very different sound world than that of the more ubiquitous symphonic arrangement. Mm -hmm. 
That's the first grouping. <clears throat> now, if we look at Gershwin's pencil score, we see that this opening passage is the most fully fleshed out of the entire manuscript. There are instrumental assignments for the melody, articulation and accent markings throughout, and dynamics specified for individual lines. Gershwin dutifully wrote out staves for the presence of both the piano and the jazz band, even though he ultimately only employed the piano in the first, or sorry, only employed the jazz band in the first three systems. Such care suggests greater attention paid and perhaps greater time allotted to these opening passages. Accordingly, the ink score for these first 29 measures appears almost identical to the pencil score from which it was copied. Now, if Gershwin did indeed begin to notate Rhapsody in Blue on Monday, January 7th, as the pencil score indicates, his progress appears to have been interrupted just a few days later by other work, namely, Sweet Little Devil, a new musical for which he had composed the score. Now, Sweet Little Devil had previously been named A Perfect Lady, and it had completed its out-of-town tryout run in Boston later that same week, either on the 10th or 11th of January. Somewhere between that show's Broadway run and its bro or sorry, somewhere between the show's Boston run and its Broadway premiere some 10 days later, the opening sequences for the second and third acts were rewritten and Gershwin contributed at least two new songs to this effort and possibly provided additional dance material for the dance sequences as well. Now, we don't know exactly when this additional music was written, but if Gershwin did take time away from Rhapsody in Blue to tend to the opening preparations of this musical, even just for a few days, upon his return to the Rhapsody, the pressure to compose quickly would have been even greater. Such haste appears to be documented in the pencil manuscript. We see a clear shift in Gershwin's notation between the careful outlay of music in the first grouping and that which followed in the second grouping. When Gershwin returned to his notation of Rhapsody in Blue, he began with what became the first piano cadenza. It started out confidently enough, and then Gershwin appears to have struggled with exactly how to proceed. He notates a rapid chromatic ascent in the right hand of the piano over a repeated pedal bass. And this dramatic segue leads, leads to the reemergence of the opening Ritornello theme played by a fortissimo, marked and jazzy full ensemble. And as you can see, uh, Gershwin crossed this out. He opted for a more subtle pianissimo conclusion to the first piano cadenza. And this leads into the first piano statement of the Ritornello theme. So instead of having the jazz band come in full on at the beginning of the piece, he has the piano introduce the theme for the first time instead. Now, given that Gershwin seems to have had little plan as to what would be coming next, it should come as no surprise that Ferdi Groffet was in the same boat. Groffet's full score manuscript of the Rhapsody bears the markings of an experienced and methodical orchestrator, even at this relatively early stage in his career. Groffet laid out his staff systems prior to entering any music on a given page. Instruments and brackets were done in ink first, and then he added evenly spaced measure lines in pencil. And it was only after taking these steps that he began to enter the music. As mentioned previously, the first grouping of the ink manuscript represents the first 29 measures of Rhapsody in Blue, and Groffet likely scored through these rather quickly. On the screen here, we see measures 23 through 28 of his full score, a little bit uh, re uh, obscured by the reflections off of the hermetically sealed plastic enclosure um, that was put around it during the preservation process. 
Now, eager to continue, we can see on the next page of Grofe's manuscript that he had pre-notated systems and bar lines for the continued presence of the full ensemble. And these have been erased. You can kind of maybe see the erased lines that are, that are faded there in between the darker black lines. The double bar line that you see there in the two lines, that represents the end of grouping one and the start of grouping two. So when Groffet received the second grouping of the ink score, which began with the piano cadenza, instead of the continued presence of the full orchestra, he had to remeasure his page accordingly to make room for the plethora of arpeggios that unfolds at the outset of that first piano cadenza. Now this is not the only such instance where Groffet had to rebar a section of the Rhapsody because of an unexpected change between groupings received from Gershwin. Another example can be found at the end of grouping three of the ink manuscript, which corresponds to page 25 of the Grofe Whiteman score. Once again, we see the erasure of pre-notated bar lines to accommodate the start of a piano cadenza. I'd like to turn my attention here to a little, to a little bit closer examination of this third grouping, because it holds a great deal of information about the genesis of Rhapsody in Blue, including further evidence that Grofe used this ink manuscript, as well as evidence about the compressed compositional timeline. At least four different hands, at least four different people writing um, in the manuscript can be found in this ink score. And you can look at figure four on your handout or the slide up on the screen. Each scribal hand, each musician who's copying this ink score from the pencil manuscript, had a distinguishable method of forming note heads, clefts, accidentals, and, and letters. The first change in copyist maps directly onto the first and second grouping. The second copyist appears on uh, at the start of grouping two, and then continues on to the first page of grouping three. Then all of a sudden, at the bottom of the first page of grouping three, in the middle of a new theme, right there highlighted in blue, music notated by Gershwin suddenly appears. The clearest indication we have of this change is, uh, in addition to the change of pen, are the shapes of the note heads and the flat signs, as well as a loosening of the vertical alignment between and within the staffs. Now, Given the constraints under which Gershwin composed Rhapsody in Blue, it's curious that he took time away to copy out this portion of the score on his own. I believe that Gershwin did this because he was under pressure to deliver additional pages to Groffet, and he had only just completed composing this passage himself. Gershwin's notation begins in the middle of the appearance of the stride theme, where the descending line in the bass clef moves it into the subdominant. Assuming that the copyist that had been working with him uh, had copied all available music prior to taking a break, this implies that this particular theme remi remained uncompleted by Gershwin at the time. And so Gershwin appears himself to have taken a break in the middle of writing the stride theme. The pencil score supports this supposition as well. You can see in there a slight yet visible shift in the pencil notation that suggests Gershwin indeed returned to complete the stride theme at a later point. Now, Gershwin appears to have crafted portions of Rhapsody in Blue to avoid cliches of typical jazz band arrangements. Such cliches from this time period include the standard unfolding of verse and refrain with minimal development of the themes. And an attempt to break this kind of, or an attempt to put in, rather, a set of compositional variations apply, occurs at this very moment where Gershwin took a break from completing the stride theme. Up to this point, throughout the first eight measures or so of the theme, the th it resembles a standard, what we call an AABA, Tin Pan Alley song form. That is, it, uh, we have the first four measures, and then the next four measures are repeated, so it's kind of an, the same thing, A, then A. And then, this is where he takes the break, right at the end of that red box there. And he begins the start of what becomes the B theme. Now, instead of repeating the A theme after the B theme, as we would expect in an AABA song form, um, Gershwin makes a, makes, takes a little bit of a detour. The rhythmic pulse and block chord melody that's heard in this A theme evaporates into a thrice repeating linking theme. You see that here? One, two, and three. And then this is punctuated by four chords and a cymbal crash. Now I'm going to play this for you in a minute so you can hear what I'm talking about. Uh, but the most important point here is that these compositional choices result in an elision, an avoidance of standard Tin Pan Alley song form, and they move the piece forward with a rhapsodic finesse, so to speak. So here's what this passage sounds like. <laughs>
That little cymbal crash there is where you would take the 78 RPM record and flip it over for the second half <laughs> of the recording. <clears throat> now, a small yet revealing moment in this portion of the third gathering provides an important piece of written evidence in support of my argument that Graffet depended on the ink score rather than the pencil score. In the midst of transferring music from the pencil to the ink manuscript for this portion of Rhapsody in Blue, Gershwin introduced various revisions. Other copyists involved in the preparation of the ink score did not revise as such. So consider, for example, a modification that occurs at measure 145. This measure links the A and B sections of the so-called shuffle theme. And uh, in the pencil manuscript that you see here, the transition consists only of a, a D7, a dominant 7 D chord, in the treble clef on the first beat. And that's followed by this kind of ascending uh, eighth note scale in the bass clef. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. If you look at the ink manuscript, you can see that Gershwin added three ascending eighth note dyads to the treble clef. Blump, blump, blump. Now, these notes subsequently become a brief trumpet soli in the Grofet Whiteman score. Had Grofet been working from the pencil manuscript rather than the fair copy ink manuscript at this point, no such soli would have appeared in his final score for the Whiteman Orchestra. Additionally, Grofet mentions in an interview from the early 1960s that such a fair copy manuscript was in use. Grofet stated that at some point in the process, the preparation of this fair copy manuscript became impractical because, quote, time was getting short. Now, I'd like to pause over Ger Grofet's observation that time was getting short and return to my proposal that Rhapsody in Blue was composed even more rapidly than previously considered. Although we cannot conclusively align particular passages or groupings with specific dates, a comparison between the pencil ink and Grofet Whiteman's scores makes clear that Gershwin, and as a result Grofet, encountered a lot of starts and stops in the process of setting Rhapsody in Blue down on paper. Now, I've already suggested that after Gershwin began notating Rhapsody in Blue on January 7th, that he got as far as page three before attending to the premiere of Sweet Little Devil. Assuming a return to work uh, uh, after its Broadway premiere on the night of January 21st, Gershwin would have had only seven days to work before traveling to Boston for a recital with Eva Gautier on the evening of Tuesday, January 29th. Now, it's possible that Gershwin's impending departure prompted the appearance of his hand in that ink manuscript in that section that I just showed you. This also might coincide with Grofet's subsequent demand that they stopped wasting time with a fair copy manuscript. Now, regardless of what point on the timeline Grofet began to use the pencil manuscript instead of the ink manuscript, they were both clearly feeling pressure to compose the Rhapsody in Blue and complete it before its premiere. The third and final public rehearsal for Whiteman's experiment in modern music took place on February 5th, exactly one week after Gershwin's recital in Boston. So by my estimation, Rhapsody in Blue was created in less than 14 days, about half as long as we previously assumed. If Grofet's recollection is correct, then copying out the ink score became impractical. It would explain the sudden end of Gershwin's notation in the ink score at measure 174. The blue box here on the screen shows you where the new copyist takes over and Gershwin's hand leaves the document. It seems that whenever Gershwin was feeling particularly short on time, um, that he inserted a piano solo or a piano cadenza. We see this every single time there's a break in the groupings or a break in the, in the compositional process or he gets stuck he starts a piano solo. So next time you're listening to Rhapsody in Blue and you hear a piano cadenza begin, you can think, oh, I know why Gershwin did that. He was pressed for time. Now this cadenza marks the onset of 142 consecutive bars of piano solo with little instrumental accompaniment for Grofet to score. Clearly it became more practical for Grofet just to work from the pencil manuscript as the premiere date drew ever closer. So contrary to previous assumptions, for at least the first 175 measures of Rhapsody in Blue, Gershwin worked from the ink score rather than the pencil manuscript. Now given that only 13 instrumental indications appear in these measures and that Grofet chose to ignore half of them, manuscript evidence suggests that he was responsible for a majority of the scoring choices made in the first third of this piece. This level of independence persists even after measure 175, the point at which Grofet began to use the pencil score. With the exception of a single solo horn line, Gershwin provided no further indication of instruments from this point forward. So why does all of this matter? Well, if Grofet indeed scored the Rhapsody with a significantly greater degree of independence than previously assumed, we can more directly address how his selection of specific instruments and the implementation of other jazz band arranging techniques transformed Gershwin's so-called completed sketch 
into a fully-fledged, musically engaging composition. In his landmark study on Fletcher Henderson, musicologist Jeffrey McGee states that, quote, like a composer, an arranger gives original shape to a piece of music, creating unity and contrast through a variety of musical elements. Like an improvising soloist, McGee continues, an arranger takes existing material and uses it as the framework for a fresh new conception, end quote. One reality of the Rhapsody, and indeed one of its most frequent criticisms, is that large passages offer little more than AABA Tin Pan Alley style tunes. The decisions that Grofe made in transitioning the Rhapsody from Gershwin's two piano pencil score to the Whiteman arrangement lent the piece a necessary level of coherence and unity through textural and timbral variety. Thinking back to Gershwin's letter to the general manager of ASCAP, can we define Grofe's role as akin to that of Gershwin? Gershwin's first biographer, Isaac Goldberg, suggested that, he might, that we might. He said, the contribution of Grofe was of prime importance. It is strange indeed that he was not represented on Whiteman's program as a composer. Gershwin, of course, strongly disagreed with such a notion. Gershwin stated that, quote, the ability to orchestrate is a talent completely apart from the ability to create. The world is full of the most competent orchestrators who cannot, for the life of them, write four bars of original music, end quote. So for Gershwin then, it was the themes rather than the overall sound of the Rhapsody that counted as the quote unquote composition. His perspective to, uh, conforms to his experience as a songwriter and as a man of the theater. In Gershwin's estimation, it would seem that orchestrators offer little more than a paint by numbers approach, the casual addition of color to a fully outlined work. However, as the Ink Manuscript reveals, Grofe's contributions to the Rhapsody were anything but casual, even given the time constraints under which he worked. So this prompts an important question. If Grofe had been a lesser arranger, would the Rhapsody have become the success that it did? After all, this is a work that not only became legendary during Gershwin's lifetime, circulating as an arrangement through live performance, recordings, and sheet music, but it also is one that maintains its standing as one of the quintessential examples of American concert music. Both the original Whiteman arrangement and the arrangement for symphony orchestra that we are perhaps more familiar with today, both of these arrangements were prepared by Ferdi Grofe. Now the decisions that Grofe made in transitioning Rhapsody in Blue from Gershwin's two piano pencil score to the Whiteman arrangement lent the piece a ne necessary level of consistency through its variety, through its novelty. This variety and novelty is lost in a subsequent arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue for s the symphony orchestra. And some critics feel that this arrangement, it, that it makes Rhapsody suffer because of the result of its smoothed over orchestration. Musicologist David Schiff, for example, opines that it, quote, obscures the idiomatic colors of the original Paul Whiteman arrangement. Although a degree of sonic coherence is expected of classical symphonic works, it was the sonic novelty of Ruffet's scoring upon which Gershwin relied when he originally assembled the various themes of the Rhapsody. When the novel scoring for the talents and timbres of the Whiteman ensemble are removed, the piece loses a great deal of momentum, particularly in the often repeated Ritornello passages. And it's this lack of sonic interest um, that is what encourages the introduction of a lot of cuts into modern performances of Rhapsody in Blue. And I'd like to use this phenomenon of cutting and arranging Rhapsody in Blue to turn my attention to one of the most notorious or notable interpreters of Rhapsody in Blue, depending on your perspective, Mr. Leonard Bernstein. <clears throat> now, Rhapsody in Blue owes much of its global popularity and academic insecurity to Leonard Bernstein. He engaged with the work continually over the course of his multifaceted career, leaving his interpretive mark through copious concerts, broadcasts, recordings, and writings. His 1959 recording of the piece with the New York Philharmonic remains one of, if not the, best-known recordings of the piece. Yet, it is also an arrangement. Or rather, it's an arrangement of an arrangement. It takes Ferdi Grofe's symphonic setting of the Rhapsody and introduces various cuts and tempo alterations. We heard Bernstein's recording of the Rhapsody in the background prior to the start of my talk, but as a means of putting that performance back in our ears, I'd like to contrast this with George Gershwin's own performance. So we're going to hear two brief audio examples. Both excerpts are of the same solo piano passage, the blues-derived shuffle theme, which is located midway through the Rhapsody. First, you will hear George Gershwin's piano roll performance, which he recorded in 1927. 
This is followed by Bernstein's own interpretation of the passage as played on this 1959 recording. So first, here's Gershwin. As you can hear from this example, Bernstein's interpretation relieves much of the jazz age energy of the Rhapsody, as originally performed by George Gershwin. Ironically, much of what makes Bernstein's 1959 recording well-liked are the very same features that critics find problematic. Bernstein's exaggerated piano performance, his sudden and dramatic transitions between passages, his elongation of particular mo melodic motifs, he has constant tempo fluctuations. Now, despite that, the fact that Bernstein introduces various cuts, which have also been criticized, his recording of Rhapsody in Blue lasts four to five minutes longer than the version of Rhapsody in Blue heard at its premiere. And indeed, his recording is one of the longer ones on record. When considering, considering Bernstein and Rhapsody in Blue, critics and scholars typically invoke the same two documents, this well-known recording, as well as his 1955 essay titled A Nice Gershwin Tune, which I mentioned very briefly at the start of my talk. <clears throat> in this essay, Bernstein muses on the similarities and differences between himself and Gershwin. It takes the form of an imaginary dialogue, a conversation between Bernstein and his professional manager, though both voices are ultimately Bernstein's. Professional manager is referred to as PM for short. And in the course of their discussion, they consider Gershwin's compositional abilities vis-a-vis -vis the Rhapsody in Blue. PM tells Bernstein that Gershwin was, quote, every inch a serious composer. But Bernstein cuts him off, responding in a passage that has since become infamous. Now, PM, you know as well as I do that the Rhapsody is not a composition at all. It's a string of separate paragraphs stuck together with a thin paste of flour and water. Composing is a very different thing from writing tunes, after all. Gershwin aficionados are quick to point out that Bernstein's subsequent influence on the reception of Rhapsody in Blue and of Gershwin Biographer Howard Pollock suggests that a nice Gershwin tune sullied the reputation of the work, particularly since it directly informed performance decisions made by Bernstein's 1959 recording. In spite of its tremendous popularity, David Schiff calls this recording a, quote, crisis in the performance history of the piece. As musicologist Larry Starr observes, such considerations typically, quote, function as a kind of received wisdom or even party line on Gershwin in academic and critical circles. Upholding this doctrine, however, assigns a degree of indifference to Bernstein where one does not exist. It also ignores the more complex relationship that ultimately existed between Bernstein, Gershwin, and Rhapsody in Blue. Bernstein's essay did not simply beget Bernstein's recording, nor did either represent a hasty interpretation of the Rhapsody. They both resulted from his multi-decade relationship with the piece, a relationship that emerges from arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue. From an early age, Bernstein had a fervent attraction to the music of George Gershwin. He purchased Gershwin's scores, he staged his musicals with friends, he even attended the 1935 pre-Broadway tryout production of Porgy and Bess in Boston when he was 17 years old. Throughout it all, Rhapsody in Blue stands out. It's unclear when he first heard the Rhapsody, but at the age of 13, Bernstein begged his father for money to buy a copy of the sheet music. Lifelong friend and colleague Sid Raymond was with the 13-year-old Lenny the day that he purchased the $2 score. Now, Sid Raymond, uh, who grew up with Bernstein, would become a successful Broadway arranger on his own right. He worked with Bernstein on West Side Story as well as several other Bernstein works, uh, including The Mass. Now, recalling the day that his friend Lenny purchased the sheet music for Rhapsody in Blue, Raymond stated, quote, We went back to Lenny's place, and he opened it, and at sight, he started to play it. Because he was, as you know, a prodigious sight reader, he could read almost anything immediately. Then he got to a certain point and he said, you know, I wonder why Gershwin wrote it in this key. And then Lenny started to play it in another key. Bernstein purchased the solo piano arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue that was first published by Harms of New York in 1927. Now remarkably, Bernstein's own copy of this sheet music survives in the New York Philharmonic archives. 
the score shows frequent and sorry, the score shows signs of frequent and animated use through its scotch tape binding repairs and smudged corners from repeated page turning. There's a taunting remark about Bernstein's sister uh, that scrawled across the top of the front cover. It says, "Shirley B has a crush on Clark Gable." Although such markings remind us that this document is a product of adolescence, annotations within the sheet music reveal that Bernstein's approach to the Rhapsody was really anything but juvenile. Bernstein himself said of this first experience with the sheet music, he said, quote, we went home and we played it with tears until dawn, the excitement. We made our own sort of arrangement so that we could do it four hands and try to sound like an orchestra. So pencil markings found within this manuscript uh, record one such possible arrangement. There's 12 sets of brackets that mark off, uh, mark off the solo passages from the orchestral passages so that the two boys could have traded the parts back and forth. We also see in the score indications such as obligato, where the piano and the orchestra would have been played together in a forehand piano performance. Significantly, the solo piano sheet music that was acquired by the boys that fateful day contains a pair of unique cuts that do not appear in previous or subsequent publications of the sheet music. In fact, this 1927 score is nearly 60 measures shorter than the more common two-piano arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue published by Harms in 1925. So when Leonard Bernstein first learned to play the Rhapsody, it was with these cuts firmly in place. So as a 13-year-old, Bernstein was already experimenting with and arranging Rhapsody in Blue, and this personal copy of the sheet music documents many of these musical explorations. Five years later, during the summer of 1937, Instead of spending time at the family's lake house in Sharon, Massachusetts, the 18-year-old Bernstein took a job at Camp Onoda, a recently established all-boys Jewish camp in the Berkshires. Bernstein was in charge of a cabin of campers from New York City, and he served as, swimming, as a swimming counselor. Not surprisingly, he also organized all musical activities, staging productions of Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance and Gershwin's Of the I Sing. He formed small musical ensembles, and he even wrote camp songs. The text of one surviving example reads as follows. <clears throat> o Noda Camp, the end is near, and soon we'll have to say goodbye to you, we fear. Our hearts are sad, our eyes are damp, because we have to part with you, O Noda Camp. <laughs> a dawn, adieu, and au revoir, a better time we never saw. We got the things that we came here for, so a dawn, adieu, a fidersane, and au revoir. Bernstein's lighthearted ditty takes on a more poignant tone, however, when considered in the context of George Gershwin's sudden death that very same summer. Gershwin died following emergency surgery on an undiagnosed brain tumor on July 11, 1937. The event had a profound and permanent effect on the young Bernstein. He later divulged, quote, the great tragedy for me the musical tragedy of my life was that I never met him, end quote. And just as a side note, um, today actually marks the 25th anniversary of the passing of Leonard Bernstein in 1990. <clears throat> in what appears to be a tribute to his musical idol, Bernstein created his own arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue, which is located here in the archives of the Library of Congress. This is the cover of the Shermer's Harmony tablet in which the arrangement is located. And here, are the first and last pages of the manuscript. Bernstein completed this arrangement on August 10, 1937, almost one month to the day after Gershwin's death. The instrumentation of this whimsical interpretation of the Rhapsody is notable. In addition to the expected piano and clarinet, it calls for a recorder, accordion, three male voices, <clears throat> which also must whistle, two ukuleles, and a percussion ensemble that he refers to as rhythm band. Bernstein's choices appear to be largely delineated by the availability of particular performers, um, if, not, if not performers, then at least instruments that we would find in a camp environment. And while there's no record that this arrangement was or was not performed, it does appear to have been written with performers from Camp Onoda in mind. <clears throat> the clearest suggestion of this appears in a photograph taken at camp that very same summer. This is the first known image of Leonard Bernstein conducting. <laughs> the caption reads, Onoda Rhythm Band and Leonard Bernstein, 1937. And this is the same rhythm band called for in his Rhapsody arrangement. 
Dressed in his Camp Onoda tank top, Bernstein directs a group of seven young musicians who are playing a battery of percussion instruments, including two triangles, claves, chimes, cymbals, a tambourine, and even what appears to be a kalimba, or a thumb piano. Bernstein's camp arrangement of the Rhapsody includes some of these very same instruments, so it's possible that some of the boys seen in this photograph took part in a performance of the piece. Now, I had the pleasure of editing a performing edition of this arrangement, and with the permission of both the Gershwin and Bernstein estates, the work had its world concert premiere during Harvard's Leonard Bernstein Boston to Broadway Festival back in 2006. It has not been heard publicly since that time. So I'm particularly excited to be able to share an excerpt from that performance with you this evening. <clears throat> The clip that I'm going to play begins at rehearsal letter J. It's on the second system of this manuscript, just after the second piano cadenza, which is notated simply as piano cadenza. <clears throat> Earlier, I played contrasting versions of the Rhapsody by Gershwin and Bernstein. Right? This is the same solo piano passage, but here it's scored out for camp instruments. And it should pro provide you with a sense of the 18-year-old Leonard Bernstein's overall approach to Rhapsody in Blue in this arrangement. <clears throat> because he would have had it memorized. <laughs> now, it's important to reiterate that Bernstein's instrumentation in this passage replaces what would have otherwise been an extended piano solo passage. <clears throat> that is, instead of just playing these measures on the piano, he arranged them to be played by his campers. The choices made here reflect Bernstein's emerging theatricality. The drama of the Largo clarinet solo sets up the playful reinterpretation of the standard campfire sing-along, which is offered by disembodied, textless voices and ukuleles. In addition to the introduction of imitative color combinations, we have this uh, substitution of the accordion for what would have otherwise been uh, rapid 16th note piano tremolos. What this does is it, it intensifies the dramatic arch of Gershwin's modulating melody, uh, to which Bernstein adds a triumphant and newly composed clarinet solo. Such decisions foreshadow the centrality of showmanship in Bernstein's future presentations of Rhapsody in Blue. This excerpt from Camponota, uh, this, sorry, this excerpt from the Camponota arrangement demonstrates Bernstein's continued car compartmentalization of Gershwin's themes. Much in the same way as the annotated brackets function in Bernstein's 1927 solo piano sheet music, um, Bernstein here demarcates transitions by fermatas, grand pauses, dramatic shifts in dynamic and instrumentation. And in one particularly striking instance, he adds a transposition. This transposition occurs at the entrance of the love theme. In Gershwin's original Rhapsody, this theme is preceded by a B dominant seven chord, which sets up a dominant to tonic five seven to one uh, transition <clears throat> into the key of E major. Now, when Bernstein resets it, at letter N in his, his, uh, in his uh, manuscript, instead of moving to E major, he transcribes the love theme up a third higher into the key of G major. 
So let me play these to you so that you can hear the difference. This is the original. And this is Bernstein's. So why might Bernstein have done this? Um, as you can hear, this is very much a kind of a Broadway show tune style modulation, the kind that fur further heightens the drama of the melody. But it also echoes Sid Raymond's recollection about Bernstein's first reading of the sheet music, where Bernstein questioned why Gershwin wrote it in one key and then proceeded to play it in another key. I suspect that this transposition here reflects that initial impulse. These early arrangements of the piece, the solo piano sheet music and the Campanota arrangement, these affected Bernstein's mature interpretations of the Rhapsody. As I mentioned, the solo piano sheet music that Bernstein acquired contains a number of unique cuts. According to an unpublished 1986 interview, this is the version that Bernstein preferred. He stated, quote, I have to confess to you, and even if this is a public confession, this is the way that I've always played it. So that when I do play it with orchestras, and I've played it with many orchestras, I have to redo the score to fit the way that I learned it because that is the way that I love it. That is the way I know it, and I think it works better." End quote. And in fact, with the exception of two measures, Bernstein's famous recording of Rhapsody in Blue with the New York Philharmonic follows the cuts taken in this 1927 solo piano sheet music note for note. Now it's been said that the cuts located in this recording quote, arguably undermine the work's structural integrity. However, if we return to Bernstein's essay, A Nice Gershwin Tune, <clears throat> we see that Bernstein relished in the structural flexibility of the work. Bernstein states that with the Rhapsody, you can cut out parts of it without affecting the whole in any way except to make it shorter. You can remove any of these stuck together sections and the piece still goes on as bravely as before. You can even interchange these sections with one another and no harm is done. You can make cuts within a section, or add new cadenzas, or play it with any combination of instruments, or on the piano alone. It can be a five-minute piece, or a six-minute piece, or a 12-minute piece. And in fact, all of these things are being done to it every day. It's still the Rhapsody in Blue. The considerations advanced in this 1955 essay, however, were not recent relevations. The considerations advanced in this 1955 essay, however, were not recent revelations to Bernstein. Rather, they were observations formed while growing up, observations delineated in his camp arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue. It makes various cuts, connects separate sections, and alters the orchestration. It even goes so far as to change the key of one of the work's most famous themes, something he discovered was a possibility as early as 1931. As the recording of his camp arrangement demonstrates, Bernstein's later remarks are true. Regardless of the alterations made to the piece, it remains Rhapsody in Blue. So on paper, you know, the composite record made up by the copyright registry, published editions of the sheet music, and even the program for the work's premiere, on paper, George Gershwin remains the sole composer for Rhapsody in Blue. And the piece will forever remain George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. But the creation and maintenance of its iconicity results only from the arrangement of the piece by a host of other musicians over the course of time. In this sense, it's a work in movement, to borrow a phrase from semiotician and philosopher Umberto Eco. The Rhapsody remains an open text for musical interpretation, in large part because of its inherent flexibility. The notion that anyone can make something of the piece, in whatever way they choose to do so, is what has made it so attractive to countless musicians over the course of the past 90 years. Now, my re remarks this evening have been limited to the roles of Ferdi Ruffe and Leonard Bernstein, but a multitude of prominent and little-known musicians have also taken the Rhapsody on in their own unique ways. In the jazz world, this includes figures such as Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, and Marcus Roberts. In the popular world, we see arrangements by Diodato, Ben Folds Five, and Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. We also encounter arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue on the silver screen. We see it in Woody Allen's Manhattan, Disney's Fantasia 2000, and Buzz Lerman's The Great Gatsby. Let's also not forget about United Airlines. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Like a rhapsody itself, the story of Rhapsody in Blue unfolds continually. It moves from one musician, venue, or conception to the next without formal design or intent, all the while revealing new perspectives on that which has come before and providing a platform for understanding future encounters with the work. Arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue tell the tale of its ongoing composition, both with respect to the music itself and the history that surrounds it. A different collection of arrangements than those considered here tonight would result in different themes, raise different concerns, and provide alternate narratives about the past and the present. Nonetheless, the ultimate point of approaching the Rhapsody through arrangements would remain much the same. Shifting the emphasis away from a centralized composer and text does not rescind the iconic status of either George Gershwin or of Rhapsody in Blue. Rather, it provides insight into why their elevated standing persists in American culture today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I believe there's some time for, for questions if, if anyone has any. I think there's a microphone as well. <clears throat> One, not to be too personal, uh, what year were you born? What year was I born? <laughs> the late 1970s. Okay. I met Lenny Bernstein in 72 in college, Trinity College. Uh -huh. He went to Harvard. He had a good friend named Dr. Clarence Barber. Okay. Barber went off into musicology, and as he used to say, Lenny just went off into theatricality, <laughs> okay? Lenny used to come by the college at least two, three times a year. The time I met him, I was listening to his performance of the Mahler Eighth mm -hmm. while studying. He banged on the door of the music room. I thought he was one of my friends trying to annoy me. I couldn't see his face. I opened the door about to punch him in the face, and there's my chairman of the music department and Lenny. And he says, Walter Thompson, this is Lenny Bernstein. Lenny Bernstein, this is Walter Thompson. We became good friends because I criticized him on his rubato in the first movement of the Mahler Wraith. Mm -hmm. So he knew that I could criticize him and we'd be good buddies. I met him <laughs> many, many times. I can't believe that this lecture that you've given is so accurate, so well representative of Lenny's personality. I assure you, Everything you said about the Rhapsody is what we used to talk about, used to argue about. And I want to thank you for giving me his personality again. I can't believe it's been over 25 years since I used to argue with him. It's hard to believe, yeah. The, the one major argument, the Mahler 10th Symphony. He <laughs> refused to play beyond the first movement. I used to, Lenny, who else but you and I arguing about this music? Why aren't you going to do it? And he refused because he could not accept Mahler's interpretation of the tritone. Okay, I, I mean, we, I used to almost beat him up. <laughs> um, one time he did the Mahler <clears throat> Fifth Symphony, the Adagietto at Central Park. I was there in the front row on the left. He closed his eyes while performing. I conducted it with my eyes closed in the audience. Later when I ran up to argue with him again about the Mahler, his daughter was there and she says, oh my God, he's the guy who conducted just like you. We both, she said, she swore that our motions were exactly the same even though our eyes were closed. <laughs> then finally, the last major time I ran into Lenny was at the, before, at the um, oh boy, Napoleon by the great, oh God, oh God, I kept remembering. Abel Gunn. Right, and we met during the intermission. I had two glasses of champagne in my hand. I'm about to put one in because I'm double fisting really quick and somebody bumps into the back of me real hard. I turn around with my fist he turns around with his fist. We shout, Lenny, Waller, ah! We <laughs> hugged each other. We're both totally drenched with champagne. And his daughter says, wow, it's Walter. And everybody there who's in um, Texas say, who's this Walter? And she has to explain to him <laughs> the weirdness of our relationship, OK? I just want to say thank you so very much. You brought Lenny back into this room. Oh, my pleasure. And everything you said about the Rhapsody, he said to me, I swear to it is true, OK? <laughs> he called it an arrangement. And you can stick this way and that way and pop around with it. And when you sit with Lenny, and if he's at a piano, he has at least three to five cigarettes going on at the same time. 
<laughs> okay, so I breathed in his smoke so many times I can't, I can't stand it when I think about what he did. And he would, it's like he didn't even know he was doing it. So that's, that's the one thing missing from your talk. You weren't just stimulating <laughs> enough with the cigarette. I'll make sure to bring cigarettes next time. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, great talk. Um, I don't know if you can give a concise answer to this, but but in the midst of this sort of view of Rhapsody in Blue as an arrangement, mm -hmm. well, what does I, I you're working you're working somehow on your critical edition, which I see is sort of four different versions. So yeah. how does the notion of a critical edition fit into this perspective? It's a really good question. Um, so uh, those of you that, that don't know, the, the George Gershwin Initiative is taking place out of the University of Michigan. Uh, is an attempt to put together the first full critical edition of George Gershwin's works. And a critical edition is basically known um, historically as kind of an urtext, as the definitive version of a composition. Um, and that seems to go a little bit against what I'm talking about here tonight, right? Um, which is a, a really fair observation and question. And so um, when the Ch uh, chief editor of the edition approached me about, you know, working on the 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 Rhapsody in Blue edition, and actually I'm on the editorial board as well. I said, well, you know that I don't think there should be a single version of Rhapsody in Blue, don't you? And he said, absolutely. That's exactly why we want you to do it, um, <laughs> because who better than the person who doesn't think there should be one to do it? Um, Anyways, so we're, we, are, we are doing, um, as you mentioned, four separate arrangements of, of Rhapsody in Blue for the edition. Um, the first arrangement is going to be as close to as possible as the way that Rhapsody in Blue was performed at the premiere performance in 1924. That's the edition that will be published hopefully this next year. Um, and that will be the first edition published in the whole critical edition series. Um, we're also doing an edition that is going to be the two piano version, which will be just the, um, the version that is probably the most familiar that has the solo piano part as well as the secondary jazz band part built into it. Um, that one's going to be keyed as closely as possible to existing manuscripts, probably a combination of the three that I've been discussing here tonight. Um, the other edition is the symphonic version because uh, one of the big goals of this critical edition is to have a clean set of new performing parts for orchestras to use around the world. Uh, so they'll do the symphonic version. And then a, a version in, of the Rhapsody, an arrangement that I didn't talk about tonight, which is another one by, by Ferdi Groffet, um, is the theater orchestra arrangement. And this, I think, is the most flexible of all of the arrangements that were done. Groffet completed the theater orchestra arrangement um, sometime in 1926. And this score also is in the Library of Congress archives here in the music division. And what that one does is it it allows for ensembles and orchestras or jazz bands to play the piece if you're not the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, right? If you don't have someone who can play five instruments and alternate between them, which most orchestras wouldn't, most jazz bands wouldn't, um, you can just choose which parts you want to play. It's a very flexible arrangement. So if you don't have someone, if you don't have a sopranino saxophone or even know what a sopranino saxophone is, then you can substitute that out with someone who plays the flute. Um, so that, that arrangement itself will be very flexible. Um, what I envision, and I don't know if this is going to be possible, is to create digital arrangements. Um, so it's not just a printed bound volume by itself, but what I would love to see us happen um, sometime in the next 30 to 40 years as we're working on this project is that you can say, you know what, I want to play the version of uh, the symphonic version the way that Lenny played it. And you hit a button, and it puts all the tempo markings in, it changes the arrangement, it makes all the cuts, and then you've got those digital versions of the scores so that you can play them. So what I'm envisioning for this, this edition of, of, of Rhapsody in Blue, and for the Gershwin edition as a whole, is a great deal of flexibility. So that it's not just one text. I think Gershwin probably would have hated the idea that we had just one text or one version of any of these works. I mean, almost everything we hear or we know of George Gershwin is an arrangement. Any song that you hear performed, you're not hearing performed just as it was published in the sheet music. We're not hearing it as it was performed in the original premiere in the Broadway theaters. It's all been arranged. Um, even more recently, the new Porgy and Bess version on Broadway is another arrangement, right? It's a whole new orchestration, but the same, the same work. And I think in that spirit, that is something that I, that I hope, to, hope that George Gershwin would enjoy and, 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 and relish seeing. Yeah. Thank you. So another question? Yes. yes. Um, thank you so much. That was, uh, I have to say, I'm a musicologist. That was the most fascinating musicology lecture that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it was wonderful. Anyway, um, I just was thinking of other Gershwin tunes like uh, Sum Summertime, yeah. which is, uh, you know, interpreted 5,000 different ways by every single uh, band nightly. And um, there's just this, I just wanted to make this comment about Gershwin being 
in Paris studying with Boulanger, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> bringing that training, she was a, a stickler for technique, and bringing that European classical music training back and integrating that with jazz and creating this whole open style is just fascinating. Um, yeah. and, and just this improvisatory style of the jazz uh, component, I think it makes me think that perhaps composition as defined is more of a classical music milieu and arrangement is more in the jazz mm -hmm. uh, milieu. Right, and Gershwin certainly was working within both of those those milieus. So, um, and just I, as far as Gershwin um, goes with um, Boulanger, it was more in a passing uh, passing relationship than an actual duration of study time. Um, I think his encounter with Boulanger is similar to his encounter with um, with Ravel. I think as the story goes where he said, "I'd like to study with you, um, you know, uh, Mr. Ravel." Um, and Ravel apparently said, "Well, how much money did you make last year?" And you know, Gershwin said, "Oh, you know, something 150,000, something like that." And he said, "Well, then I, maybe I should be taking lessons from you." <laughs> and um, and well, that that story is probably apocryphal. It's also been assigned to, to Stravinsky and and I think also to Schoenberg. A lot of people apparently had the same conversation with Gershwin. Um, <laughs> Nonetheless, it, it, he he really did absorb, you know, influences wherever he could find them. And we certainly did spend a lot of time in Paris. Um, American in Paris is probably the most famous, you know, re kind of compositional result of that as well. Um, the the primary person that he studied with with composition after the Rhapsody in Blue later on is Joseph Schillinger. Um, and, and really, if you look at, um, there's been some wonderful studies in, on, on Porgy and Bess and the effect of Schillinger and kind of the rotational comp compositional aspects that, that Schillinger introduced um, to, to Gershwin that we can certainly see in play in Porgy and Bess. Um, 1924, Gershwin still really hadn't left the country. Um, so it, with, with Rhapsody in Blue, um, this is not too long after he'd had his first big hit with the song Swanee. Um, 1924 is the same year that Lady Be Good goes on stage, and it's his first hit musical. So things really do take off from 1924, and then he does start traveling around the world and, and meeting and get, having a lot of different influences. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I think we need to cut off the questions for time, but I'm happy to answer questions as they uh, emerge afterwards. And please do sign, uh, sign, uh, join me outside for the book signing if you'd like. And thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.